Uh, Millet was sworn in as president of Argentina. Uh, I mean, this was uh, it, this was an exciting event, a, uh, a huge upside, huge potential, and uh, uh, <laughs> you know, inspiring in many regards. Here's a guy who came out of nowhere, an economics professor, uh, a, a real free marketer. Uh, and and cap, so I'll, we'll forgive him that for now. Uh, and um, and somebody who really has presented an agenda for liberating uh, Argentina's economy from decades, decades of really seventy years of uh, statist, authoritarian, socialist-like, fascist-like uh, governance. Uh, Millet is a breath of fresh air. He is, uh, a, you know, a real potential revolution, uh, and and somebody who is um, somebody who is uh, uh, more consistently free market than I think any president of a major country has ever been. So, uh, to some extent, though, um, uh, there is uh, there is a real um, a lot writing on this to to the extent that uh, to the extent that. Uh, a, a lot of people are placing a lot of hope and a lot of uh, 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 hoping for, for success of Millet. And, and I think to some extent, if, if he fails, the extent he fails, um, it, it, it will be more than him being judged. It will be the whole idea of, of uh, free markets, of economic liberalism. So, uh, so this is a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, so a, a few things. I, I want to I say a few things about this. One. The task he has taken on himself is massive. To take an economy as corrupt, as statist, uh, as dominated by the state, uh, an economy with 150% inflation, an economy that has been dysfunctional again for, for, for decades and decades. It, it's gone through periods of relative sanity, but overall been uh, uh, thoroughly um, uh, dysfunctional. Uh, a, 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 um, a, a country that is so where socialism and, uh, and a, a expectation for entitlement is deeply ingrained in the population, right? The population might have voted, a majority might have voted for Millet, but he is going to have a vocal, a super vocal, aggressive, maybe even violent minority that will oppose everything that he does is going to be unbelievably... So taking that economy and liberalizing it, liberating it, is immensely difficult, objectively immensely difficult. What do you do first? Do you cut taxes? Hopefully not. Do you uh, do away with capital controls? If you do it first, you get, you get a huge, massive flight of capital. That won't be particularly good, but if you wait to do it later, you create a whole other set of, of problems, uh, you know, which Argentina is facing right now. Do you cut government spending immediately, dramatically? That is going to create a lot of unemployment, a lot of unemployed government employees. I mean, there's a, the, the previous government uh, has engaged in massive government spending, deficit spending, massive deficit spending, in building infrastructure all over Argentina. The, all those construction workers now lose their jobs. So uh, uh, do you do that first? Do you do it gradually? Do you, uh, uh, you know, which jobs do you eliminate first? The people out there or, or the bureaucrats in the office? Millet has promised to dollarize the uh, Argentine economy and to close the central bank. Do you do that now? Do you do that later? When exactly do you do it? How do you do it? How do you dollarize? What is the mechanism by which you... And you could go on and on and on. I mean, regulations. Do you eliminate them all at once? Do you do it slowly? What about corruption? How do you, how do you, inst uh, you know, fight corruption, get it out of the system? And then there's privatizing the airline, the energy company, the, the railroads. Uh, I read a quote from a pilot who said if he's, if he's going to try to 
putts around with the airline, there's going to be blood in the streets, basically, he said. Unions very strong in Argentina. So first, let's set it up. He is, he is facing massive challenge, a massive challenge. And I haven't even mentioned the, I think, $42 billion in dollars, not in pesos, debt uh, uh, to the IMF, uh, debts to China, uh, uh, debts internationally, dollar denominated, where are those dollars going to come from? There's no money. There's literally no money in the coffers. Uh, so what does he do? And, and this is going to be the real challenge. So the first thing he's done, the first thing he's done is he's worked to grow his political base, which is smart, right? The first thing he's done is expanded his political base beyond what you would call kind of the, the, the libertarians, the radicals, and expanded it to include center-right conservatives in Argentina. And here, he's tapped a lot of the people in his government. He's got a small government, but I mean, a lot of the people in this small government are actually uh, uh, people coming in from the center-right rather than from the libertarian side. He's got a, a, a bunch of people from uh, Marci, Marquis, I'm mispronouncing his name, former president who was a complete failure but in, you know, like is 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 the most important person. The economics minister is a guy from that administration that failed completely, which I think he had to do politically because he has to have a base in parliament, and at least now he has the support. He's also backed off some of the more radical uh, proposals he made. For example, uh, he is not going to. He he said he would get out of the Paris Climate Accord. That climate change was basically a hoax. He's not doing that. He's now sent somebody. He sent somebody to COP uh, uh, 28, and 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 uh, is is uh, is going to abide by Paris Accord. He is. He said he would uh, he would uh, uh, break relations with China. He's not going to break relations with China. He's uh, he's uh, uh, the Chinese ambassador was at his inauguration, and he's he's trying to be cordial to the Chinese. Um, he said he would close the central bank. It's now clear that he, he's not going to close the central bank anytime soon. He might do that. He might do it. But I think he realizes that that cannot be the first thing he does. He needs to bring more dollars into the economy before he closes the central bank. Before he dollarizes, there actually have to be some dollars. Uh, so he has to, the first thing he has to do, and I think he realizes that, is reduce government spending. I, I wish some Republicans learned something from him. So the first thing he wants to do, he says he wants to do and should do, and I agree completely, is reduce government spending. I would add to that dramatically reduce regulations and as quickly as possible simplify a crazy, complex, uh, and, and insane tax system. I, I mean, if he could implement some kind of flat tax that would be huge in, in, in terms of getting rid of some of the corruption. A lot of the corruption happens through the tax system and, and uh, simplify investment and the lives of Argentinians. Uh, and so so I, think, I think there's a, a huge amount of upside in getting, in getting that right. In, 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 you know, first, uh, cutting spending, cutting regulation, cutting a lot of regulation, again, the sequence in you, you cut regulation is important. I hope he has somebody good who understands the process by which you cut it. Getting rid of uh, uh, simplifying the tax code uh, and, uh, and ultimately getting rid of capital controls. But again, that's going to happen, have to happen over time. He has to first build confidence in the Argentine economy, in the fact that he's cutting spending, in the fact that, oh, and one other element that you should do first, right, together with cutting spending, he should do from day one privatization. He should be immediately starting the process of auctioning off state-run enterprises across the board. Now, again, some of them you need to do smart. Some of them you just need to do quick. Like the airline, zero reason Argentina needs to have an airline. Zero reason Argentina should have an airline that's owned by the government. So just privatize it with the alternative being just closing it, shutting it down. Plenty of other airlines will fly into Argentina if, they, if the Argentinian airline goes away. 
There's plenty of competition in Latin America. So try to sell it, sell it to the highest bidder. It doesn't matter where they're from. This is another important thing about privatization. Don't just sell it to Argentinians. Sell it to whoever's willing to pay. So sell the airlines, sell the, the trains. Trains are a little trickier because they're perceived to have monopoly power. It's not easy to privatize trains, but privatize them in mass, you know, and then energy, uh, everything you can privatize. Everything you, all the low hanging fruit, that is the low hanging fruit that are bringing foreign exchange, uh, that are bringing uh, dollars, um, and that'll get stuff off of the books. These are overwhelmingly losing enterprises under government control. So to reduce government deficits, bring in money, uh, and reduce the number of bureaucrats you have to have. And then on top of that, then turn around and, and start cutting. Now, one of the first things he did was more symbolic than real, but important symbolically, is that he's already cut the number of government departments from 21 to nine, to nine, yes, to nine. Now, he originally said there would only be eight. I'm not sure what additional, um, additional um, department he saved, but anyway, the nine from 21, uh, that's huge. Uh, but this is the point. If all you do is cut the departments but consolidate their activities under fewer departments, you've done nothing. I mean, you've, you've maybe gotten rid of one small layer of bureaucracy. What really needs to happen is those departments needs to be shut down. And shutting them down means shutting down their activities. That means firing their employees. And until we start seeing dramatic, large-scale reductions in actual staffing of these, it doesn't mean a lot. It's symbolic, important. Symbolism is important. But what you actually want to see is, is people being laid off. And then secondarily, budgets eliminated, budgets gone. And that he's going to need, he's going to need parliament to help him. So I think he's bringing in parliament to session. I think they go into session in two days, I think on the 13th, um, with the idea of cutting government spending dramatically. In his inaugural address, he focused very much on there's going to be a lot of pain, and this is really, really, really important. And, and this is a, a final point I want to make because I'm spending a lot of time on this. There's going to be a lot of pain. There's no way to do this without a lot of pain, and the pain will be felt by former government employees, but not just massive uh, numbers of people in the private sector who have become dependent on government largesse, uh, contractors, uh, you know, Poor people, if you cut social spending, it's going to be widespread throughout the economy. And it's going to be, and, and they're going to be strikes, and they're going to be demonstrations, and they're going to be riots. And one of the most important things he is going to have to be do, and he's going to have to do it well. And here, I think his years of being a television commentator and being just in the public eye will help. He needs to be a master communicator. He needs to be able to communicate the message, what he's doing, why he's doing it, why this will pay off. And, and, and it was great that he started off in his inaugural address by saying, there's going to be pain. None of this is easy. The, 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 before we can resurrect this economy, we're going to have to go deeper into recession. And he said, there's going to be stagflation, stagnation and inflation. It's going to be super ugly. I think that's good. I think that's right. I think there's no choice. That is reality. You can't transition. There's, you have to pay the piper for all the bad stuff that's happened. There's no easy way. And this also involves massive redistributions of wealth. Now, I'll just note that he's not the first person to do this. Others have done this before, whether in Latin America, whether in, uh, in, in, in Chile, to some extent Peru in Eastern Europe, so he's got models from which uh, uh, to learn from. Uh, he would like to go further than any of those experiments went, uh, and that's great. But, you know, start. you got to start with somewhere. And, and um, so I'm encouraged. He's got smart people around him. I hope he doesn't sell out. 
Um, and I, I just want to make one last pessimistic point and then we're on. And that is, if he succeeds, not in turning Argentina and Lazio for heaven, because, but if he succeeds over the next four or five years, and I can't remember what the cycle of the election is, it's assumed four, or in dramatically shifting Argentina to a, a, a free economy, gets, gets spending under control and everything's moving forward. And yet he holds this radical agenda of what he wants to do in the next four years. He might very well lose. Because the reality is that the Argentinian culture is not quite, I don't think, ready and prioritizes a radical laissez-faire economy. They just wanted to get rid of the crazy. If he gets rid of the crazy and puts it on a right path, you could see him actually, you know, struggling uh, uh, from, a, from a public... This is Churchill winning World War II and then losing the next election. Um, anyway, uh, let's hope that isn't the case. But let's hope first that he succeeds because the Argentinian people, it would be important, and I think just important generally, to see somebody moving towards greater freedom as a means to greater wealth is going to be huge. Um, so so uh, good for him and uh, good luck. Good luck to me, Lee.